So yesterday, I was, uh, I was watching this commercial about bacon. And uh, so it was online. It was on, like, one of those, like, funniest commercial, like, playlists, like, top, top funniest commercials. And so it was this uh, Canadian company, um, Canadian Bacon, not Canadian Bacon, but, like, Canadian Bacon, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and anyway, so it was this commercial. And so there's this mom. She's, she's, uh, she just, ha- she has a hard life. Like she's doing laundry all the time. She's doing dishes. She's like complaining about how busy and how crazy her life is. And then one day she has this epiphany and she's, she's, uh, she, she's frustrated. And so she's making a BLT and she's got the bread. She's got the lettuce. She puts the tomato on and then she tops it off with the bacon. And then everything in her house stops. And like the husband like starts doing chores immediately as she finishes the BLT. And then like the next day she's like, and then I really realized it changed my life when the next day she's like, putting together a salad and she put some bacon bits on top of the salad and she's like kids can you set the tip and then she looked over and the kids were like there with like nice like candlelit dinner like all set up ready for and she was like she's like I think bacon just changed my life and so the announcer comes on and the announcer's like change your life with bacon visit www.changeyourlifewithbacon.com and I and I thought it was this stupid like funny commercial um, and we, we laugh about it because bacon's one of those things where like we all love bacon we get it but like it doesn't actually you know change your life obviously um, and so it actually I know maybe because I'm, I'm a Bible student but it got me actually thinking about Bible reading because Bible reading it's one of those things that people tell us like it's supposed to change your life it's supposed to be amazing it's it's going to like li- it's going to alter the rest of your life if you read your Bible and it's it's all going to be great um, but we look at it kind of like this bacon ad sometimes like oh yeah that's what they say but like we know it doesn't really change our lives it's not it doesn't like it's boring. Like I had, I do it sometimes every morning. Like I wake up and like I read it. It's really boring. I don't really get it. It's about a bunch of weird old stuff. You know, now I, I fall asleep when I read my Bible. Like it doesn't, it, they say it changes your life, but you know, I don't really, I don't really see that. It doesn't, I don't really catch that. Um, and so, so my fear is that we, we view our Bible reading kind of like that bacon ad where we don't really believe, we don't really trust that the Bible can actually change our lives. So today I want to talk about Bible reading. I want to talk about how it really, if you do it the right way, it really can change your life. Unlike bacon, change your life with bacon.com, regardless of whatever they say. Like, I think that if you read your Bible the right way and the correct way, it really can change your life. And so I want us to use this, this exciting time of, uh, of making resolutions and, and, and casting visions and goals for the future. Future. I want us to use this excitement that we have right now, being ready to like read more or, you know, do go to the gym or whatever your resolution is right now. I want us to capitalize on this excitement and use it for, for Bible reading, something that actually can change uh, your life if you, if you do it the right way. I want to resolve this year to make Bible reading and, and get serious or resolve to, to, to read our Bibles more um, this year. And so I want you guys to, to open up um, with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at two verses, two pretty familiar verses. You should probably have memorized them before if you did a wana or something like that. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses, or, or chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. I want to answer the question today, why should you read your Bible in 2019? Why, why should you do it? Anything that you do in life, you got to ask that question, why am I doing this? And so, if by reading, it's one of those things that's hard for you. It's, it, it doesn't, you don't really think that it changes your life because you've tried it before. It's boring. You know, you're not motivated to read. You fall asleep when you're reading it. So why should I do it this year? Why should I make it a goal this year to, to, to do this in my life? So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 has, has a lot to say about it. And so that's the question I want to answer today. So hopefully you've got there. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We looked at 2 Timothy 2 last week, actually. So naturally, we're in. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look down at uh, verse 16 here with me. It says, it says, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I think there's a lot here in this verse, that ha- a, a lot here to say, or the, a lot this verse has to say about why you should read your Bible this year. The first thing it says, it says all scripture is, is, is breathed out by God. Paul here, here he gives us the origin of where our Bible comes from. 
Is it something that just some some old guys randomly went together and like just wrote random you know religious things down, or where did it come from? Well, he explains where it, it where, where it comes from, the origin of the Bible, and it's really important for us to know where our Bible came from. It's really important us for us to know that it came from God because it changes the way we read it. I don't know if you've ever got like a text message before from like a friend. And, and, you know, like you see it pop up on your, on your phone and you're like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll read that later. Like you just like, you put it aside because you're like, oh, it's just my friend, like not a big deal. But like, have you ever got like a text message from someone like, like important before? Like, like, I don't know, for me, like when I get a text message from Pastor Elliot, I'm like, I, I'm not like swiping up on that one. I'm like, okay, I got, I got to like open this up and I got to read it. And it changes the way that you read it. If I got a text from Owen, I'd be like, Ah, okay, cool. If I got a text from Pastor Elliot, I'd be like, all right, uh, what, what did he say here? Like, I, if, he tell, if he tells me to do something, I should do it. So, sorry, oh, I, I think you're important, but sometimes when, when someone, w- when you get a text from someone that's really important, you're like, you're like okay, like, I got to make sure that I read this now. I got to make sure I pay attention. So that's kind of the idea here of, of the Bible. We, if, if we know that it's from God, it really should change the way that we read it. The origin of the Bible changes the way be read it. So it says here, it says breathed out by God. And I think this is a really, really good translation. Maybe you've heard this, this verse before in different translations, and it says all scripture is inspired by God. Have you ever heard that before? All scripture is inspired by God. And you know what? That's an okay translation. Um, it's fine, but I, I think, I, I love the way that ESV translated it, breathed out by God. The, the Greek word here, if you want to learn a little Greek here this morning, we're at, uh, we're here at school, so I guess, yeah, you got to learn stuff. So, so the Greek word here is the word theopanoustos, which theo, maybe you've theology, like, okay, God, like theos, you've, you've heard of that before, and panoustos is the idea of, of wind or breath or spirit. And so the idea here is God, panoustos, Theopanustos is God breathed it out. God literally is like spitting it out. Like these are actually the actual words of God. It's not necessarily just inspired, which we would call the Bible inspired by God, but I, I think it's a great word picture there of, of, of the all scripture being breathed out by God. It's actually exactly how God intended, exactly what God was actually saying. So there's a bunch of wrong views on how we, how we got our Bible. A bunch of wrong views on that the Bible is inspired by God. Some people, they believe that, you know, the biblical authors, they were just, they were sitting there one day and like, they felt like a, wow, like I feel, you know, think about Moses for a minute. Moses wrote Genesis. So he wrote like Genesis 1, 1, all that, all that stuff. So Moses one day, like sitting there like, whoa, like God, I think God created the world. Like, let me just write this down. I just, I think that happened, and so he starts writing it down. Some people believe that, how we got our Bible, and I would say that's definitely not true. Some people think that, like, Moses was in a cave somewhere, and God literally said, all right, Moses, ready? Write these words down. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Some people think that, like, every single word, like, verbatim, Moses just copied a voice in his head, and I, I don't think that's necessarily right either. Some people think that God just, or, or uh, that man just did it alone, like, Moses just sitting there one day, like God doesn't do anything, but he's like, I think, I think God created the world. Let's write it down. We, I don't think that that is maybe the correct way either. So the, so the big word, the big word, you can go home today to your parents and they're like, what'd you learn today um, at, at, at church? And you say, well, I learned about the verbal plenary uh, view of scripture. And so that, that, that's what we're going to, the verbal plenary view of scripture. That's, that's the theory that we would, we would believe, the biblical theory of, of scripture. So, that, so God, he inspires every single word. He actually means every single word that, that the biblical authors wrote, but he used their, their styles and their, their, their you know, historical you know, context and all these different things. He used things that the authors had in their life. And so Paul, he sounds really different than John. And John sounds really different than Matthew. And Matthew sounds really different than Isaiah. And Isaiah sounds really different than, you know, when David wrote scripture. And so God used all these different people's personalities and all these different people's writing styles. And he used them to produce a perfect, a perfect manuscript. And so that's, that's what we believe. I, I love what Second Peter chapter 1 says. It says, Second Peter 1 verse 20 and 21 says, No prophecy of scripture uh, comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's, that's a good, another word picture of how we got our Bibles, is, is these, these biblical authors, they were, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, and, got, and the Holy Spirit told them what's right. Maybe not verbatim, like word for word, in the beginning God created, but he, he used Moses' style of, of starting a sentence with, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and, and, and 
he produced a perfect manuscript. So if we, if God breathed the Bible, if this is the origin of where our Bible came from, if it's from God, then this is the only way for us to, to know God. And so I think that's one of the, one of the reasons that we, should, that we should read the Bible is so that we can know God better, so that we can, we, we can know who he is. So I want you to write that down for point number one. Read to know God. Why should you be reading your Bible in 2019? What, what's the point of that? Well, the first reason is I want you to read it so that you can know God. And the origin of the Bible, it plays a huge role in this. If God really breathed it out, if God really meant every word of Scripture, then it should change the way that we read it. And also, we should see it as the only way to, to know him. So you think of how you know people. You know, you, you, you know someone. How, how, how do you do that? Well, you do that with communication. How do you know your mom? Well, you communicate with her. You talk to her. Maybe not as much as she wants, but probably more than you want. But like that's, you talk to her and that's how you have a relationship with her. How do you have a relationship with your brother or sister? You have to talk to them. You have to have communication. So this is how God, it, it speaks to you. It's, it's breathed out by God. Every, every word that you find in here, God meant it. God, God, God willed it perfectly and, and said, this is, this is for you. This is, this is for you, Noah. Every word in here is for you. Oh, and this is every word here. It's, it's for you and it's, it, it's purposed so that you can read it and so that you can learn so that you can grow and so that you can know God. That's, that's the way that, that that's the, the way that we view scripture, the way that we view the origin of scripture. But also we should, we should, we should go after it. Like we, we really want to, we really want to know God better. So what does it mean to know God? Does this mean know facts about God? You think about, what about knowing of someone? You, you would think that that's different if I say like, I, I know, I don't know, I know LeBron James. And you'd be like, well, that's really cool. But what I really meant was I know of LeBron James. Like I know who he is. I know what he looks like. I've never met him before. I don't know him, know him, but I know who he is. That's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about like knowing him. Like if you, like if I was actually his friend and like, he came over to my house and I went over to his house, which I don't, I, I'd be cool if I did, but uh, I don't know him. But like, say, say that I did, that I would say I know him only if like I actually had a relationship with him, if we actually communicated, if I actually had his number and we texted back and forth and, and we call each other and we, we had a relationship. And so that's the idea that we want to do w- with God. We want to have a relationship with God. We want to not just know of him, know facts about him, but we actually want to, to know him in a personal way, in a relational way. You've probably heard this before, but, you know, people that say, you know, Christianity, it's not a religion, but it's a relationship. You've probably heard that before. It's, you know, on those cards and those, you know, posters of Christian, whatever, scripture, whatever. But, but maybe your mom has one of those posters, like pictures in, in your house somewhere. Christianity is not a, uh, not a religion, but it's a relationship. And so that's the idea that we want for, for you is we want you to have a relationship with, with, with God. We want you to be, a, be close with God, have a relationship with God. So knowing God means actually having that relationship with him. And so, so how are we going to do that? How, how are we going to know God? How, how can you know God better? How can you have a better relationship with God? Well, this really smart guy who wrote a bunch of books, his name is J.I. Packer. He wrote this book that some of the leaders here are reading. Um, it's called Knowing God. So literally the whole book is about knowing God better, having a better relationship with God. And he gives four things, four ways that you can know God. And the first one he says is you, you, you can know God through his word. You could just sit there, read his word, and, and cognitively think about the words you're, you're reading in scripture. And you, you know God by just reading and hearing his word. Next thing he says is by noting who he is. So actually looking at the Bible and thinking about, okay, who is who is God? What, what, what am I reading here in Genesis 1 about, you know, creation? What, what am I learning about God? Who, who really is God? So you're noting who he is. Next thing he says is, number three, the way you can know God is by accepting what he says, by, by believing it, by, by accepting what he commands you to do, by, by, by taking, you know, he says, don't, I mean, he says, love, love your neighbor. And you're like, okay, like knowing God is the idea of, you know that that's true, but then you also like accept it and now put it into practice. And the last thing he says is just Rejoicing in your salvation, just enjoying God, basically, is the idea there. So we're going we're to talk about this a little bit more later and how, how we can specifically read God's word in that way of thinking about knowing God better and, and, and noting who he is and accepting his commands. Um, treating, treating your Bible reading as more of a relationship, as more of a, almost a conversation. Like, you know, you, you don't really, like, go home and, like, actually, like, hear the, the words of 
God, like randomly, like he, he comes to you in your sleep or something like that. I don't think that that happens, but I think you can know God and he's speaking to you when it's, you're reading his God breathed scripture. You are reading exactly what, what he says for you and what he says for, for your life. That's, that's how you can know and have a relationship with him. By, by reading his word, by noting who he is, by accepting his commands, and now by rejoicing in your relationship and your, your salvation with him. So when you read his word, we, we, we want to actively search out who God is more. We want to identify his character. We want to read uh, scripture with, with him in mind, thinking, okay, what can I learn about God from this? Like, I don't know. I remember back in the day, I was in high school, and uh, Johnny Wright was one of my leaders in high school. Like, believe it or not, Johnny was one of my leaders. Um, I don't know if he was saying yo, yo, yo back then, but he was one of my leaders, and he was like the crazy Johnny that you know. But I remember, I remember one time, because he went to Master's College um, Bible School up in Santa Clarita, and I remember one time he came back to uh, True North, and he said, you know, I just read the book of Leviticus, and it blew my mind. And I was like, what? What a weirdo. Like, no way. Have you ever read Leviticus before? Have you ever tried to read Leviticus before? Okay, it's like, it, it's it's some some weird stuff. I'm not going to lie. Like, it's just things you read about like the type of cloth that you can wear if you're a Jew and, and the type of shellfish that you can't and can eat. And if it has a hoofed foot, like you can't eat it like a pig. But if it's got like a different kind of foot, like you can eat it because it's clean and unclean. And it's all these like rules and regulations in Leviticus. I remember he came back to True North one day and he's like, I read it and it blew my mind. I was like, how? And he was like, well, I read it with the thought of what am I learning about God when I'm reading about the hoofed foot animal and the non-hooved foot animal and the cloth that you can wear and the cloth you can't wear. And he was like, I thought about it in the way of, okay, I'm learning about who God is through the cloth and the material and, 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 and all of these rules and regulations. I learned that God is holy. He wants his people to be set apart. And that blew my mind and that blew me away. Like, okay, if, if God meant that for the Jews, then he means for me to, to be holy. You shall be holy for I am holy. He says that in the book of Leviticus and he was thinking about his life and thinking about, okay, I need to, I need to be holy. I need to be different than the world. Just like the Jews were different from, you know, the Egyptians and the, they were wearing Egyptian cotton and the Jewish people were wearing Israel cotton or whatever. I don't know. All, all the different rules and regulations that Israel do, the, the idea was they had to be set apart from the world. They had to be holy. And so I was like, wow. Like, I guess that's the key to like understanding Leviticus or understanding the book of Numbers. Have you ever read Numbers before? It's like, this guy was this dad and his son was this guy and then his son was this guy. And it, you're like, what does, this have to, what, what does this have to do with me? I don't know. Well, think about it in terms of what is God, who is God through this text? What, what, what can you learn about God's character? And so we want to be doing that when we read any kind of scripture, whether it's Leviticus, whether it's 2 Timothy, whether it's Colossians, whether it makes sense or whether it doesn't make sense. We got we to gotta go after it like we want to learn more about God. So it's God breathed. It, it's all scripture is breathed out by God, 2 Timothy says. And the next thing he says is a bunch of different things about what the Bible does. So that's the God... For all scripture is breathed out by God, that's what it is. But now what it does, we see here in a minute. So look back at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God, so we know where it came from. We know that this is the only way that we can know God. Next thing it says is, it's, pro it's profitable for four different things here. For teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So that's like six different things, not four, but six different things that he says about what God's word does in your life. And so I, I think the, the more that you know God, the more that you read your Bible and think about who God is and think about how you can know him better, it ultimately comes down to your life being changed. I, I love what, what, um, what J.I. Packer said in, in knowing God. He said, knowing God is more than, than knowing about him. It's a matter of, uh, of dealing with him as he opens up to you and being dealt with by him as he takes knowledge of you. So the idea is you know God and, and God knowing you means that now your life alters. Your life changes like the whole bacon thing. Your life is now changed because of what God is doing in his word. So I want us to, next thing for us to do um, in 2019, the way that we want to read our Bible is we want to read the Bible to, to grow. So write that down for point number two, read to grow. Why read your Bible in 2019? Well, read to know and read to grow. Oh, you see, you see that now? Know and grow. Now you can't forget it. Now you're going to go home. Now you're going to think about this 
boom. Now you're going to do what it says. This is, this is why we alliterate, or not alliterate, uh, rhyme. Wow, how old am I? Rhyme, that's the right word. You want to read the Bible to know, and you want to read the Bible to grow. You want to know God, but you also want to grow. It should change you. It should alter how you live. So the first thing he says here is all scriptures breathe out by God and it's profitable for teaching. So the first thing the Bible does is it, it teaches you. And so the idea here is it's a source of instruction and sound doctrine. And what, what God really thinks about the world, what God really thinks about you, what God really thinks about, you know, sin and, and, and holiness and all these different things. So it's a source of instruction. It's a teaching. It's, it's truth. It, it, it is true. So every, anything you read in the Bible, you can know for 100% certainty it's true. John 17, 17, B says, your word is truth. Jesus is talking about the Bible. He says, your word is, is truth. It's, it's totally true. Psalm 19, verse 7, Justin quoted it over there in the main service. He said, uh, or he, David, sorry, not Justin. David said, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. I love that. The law of the Lord is perfect. Everything you read in here is truthful. Everything you read in here is, is perfect. There is no error in the Bible. Sometimes you think you read something, you know, and you think it contradicts itself, but if you look at it closely, the Bible, like, it doesn't contradict itself. It's, it's perfect. It's, it's truthful. So the Bible, it gives us info not only about who God is, but it gives us info about the, what God thinks of the world, instruction for our lives. You think about the Bible, I mean, we would be lost without it. It's like our compass. Oh, like, Compass Bible Church. Oh, yeah, why? Because Compass Bible Church, that's a knee slapper. Wow. It's Compass Bible Church, think about it for a minute. Bible Church, the idea is we are, we are being led by the Bible. Compass is the idea of like you following after a compass. I don't know how else to word that. A, a compass like points you in the right direction, shows you where to go. It's directions. The Bible, that, that's what it does for us. It's, it's, it's a direction. Our, our theme verse comes about with church theme verse. Maybe you don't even know it, but it's Psalm 43.3. It's send out your light and your truth and let it guide me. That's, that's the idea we want with God's word. God, God, he sends out his light and his truth and we want that to now guide our lives like a compass. Maybe you're more familiar with this one. Psalm 119.105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Ever heard that one before? That's the idea of, of the Bible. It, it guides us, it directs us and instructs us in the, in the right direction. It's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I love what um, Peter says um, in John chapter 6, verse 68. This is right after Jesus. He feeds the 5,000. All these people, they, they come and get fed, and then, and then uh, they go home. And then the next day they come and they try to find bread again. And Jesus is like, you're just coming, you're just coming after me for the lunch. Like, you, just want, you just want food out of me. And they're like, yeah, we, we do. That's all we want. We just want bread. And so they, they leave him and they, 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 they don't follow Jesus anymore. And then, and then the disciples are there and Peter, he speaks to Jesus or, or Jesus, he turns to them and says, where, where are you going to go now? Are you going to leave me too? Like all these other people that want free food. And, and Peter says, he says to Jesus, I, lo- I love what he says. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we've believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. I, I love that. That's a great picture of what our Bible is. Where else can we go for direction? Where else can we go for guidance? Where else can we go to, to have a, a compass for our life? The only place we can go is, is the Bible. It has the words of eternal life. It's God-breathed instruction, teaching. It's kind of like, like, the, like the bank. I don't know if you ever used the bank before, but you make money, you get some money, and you go, you throw it in your account. You throw it in your, in your bank so you can, you can save it for later. You can use it down the road. And that's, that's what we do here with the Bible is we, we, we read it. It teaches us. It gives us instruction. And now we go put it in the, in the bank, if you will, and, and so that we can now use it to, to guide our life and to, to do something later with it. You don't just make money to like just have it. You make it to sometime, someday, you, you use it someday. And that's the idea of the Bible. You, you read it, you, you, you gain knowledge from it, you, you get taught by it. It's just your source of instruction so that one day you can, you can use it. You put, put it in the bank is what you do. The bank is open when it comes to the Bible. So teaching, that's the first thing we got to do. All scriptures breathe out by God and profitable for teaching. Next thing he says is reproof. I don't know when the last time you were, you used the word reproof. I don't know, did you text that to your friends this week, oh, reproof. You ever use that word? Do you know what that means? Okay, so the idea of reproof, maybe you will now. Maybe it's just going to be your word, hashtag reproof. Um, 
But reproof is the idea of rebuking, of, of correcting an error, exposing an error and, and, and showing an error for what it is. So it, it's a rebuke. You think about last time you were rebuked, probably by your mom. Like, you didn't make your bed this morning. What'd your mom come in and do? You're like, oh, and you didn't make your bed. And you're like, very true. yeah, it's very true. And you're like, okay, well, the error is exposed. I now know what I did wrong. And so the idea is, you know, you obviously go and fix it. Maybe, hopefully you did that this morning. I don't know. But the idea of reproof, of rebuking is, is you getting told what is wrong. So, so something's, something's going wrong in rebuke. Reproof is the idea of the negative aspect of it shows you, or the Bible shows you how you've, how you've fallen short. Remember that passage in, in James when he, uh, re- when James refers to the Bible as a mirror? Remember that? Like he, it's like a man who looks intently at himself in a mirror and then walks away and forgets what he was like. The idea of a mirror, the idea of the Bible is it's, it's like a mirror. You, you come, you read it, you look at it, and you see your reflection. You see, whoa, like, it says I have to love my enemies and I have to pray for those who persecute me. And it says I have to love my neighbor and love my mom and love my brothers and sisters. Wow, I look back, I see a reflection in, in my life and I see, wow, I, I, don't, I don't match up. I fall short. I, I fall short in X, Y, and Z. I know, I know I don't do the right thing. And so that's the idea of, of reproof here. It's rebuking you when, when, you're, when you're wrong. I want you to turn over to, to Hebrews chapter 4. Another f- hopefully familiar passage in Hebrews chapter 4. Turn there in your Bibles with me if you've got it. Your phones, your physical copies, which, hey, we got some, uh, we got some new Bibles in. So we'll have Bibles here next week. That'll be cool. So when you forget your Bible, you'll actually have a Bible. That's cool. Or you can use your phone. I don't know. But it's better to have a hard copy. I think it is. You can't get distracted. You can't go. You can't play Fortnite on this thing. You can't play uh, Brawl Stars on this thing, but you can't get distracted. So that's why you have a real Bible. There's my, there's my uh, pitch for a real Bible. So we'll have them next week. But anyway, Hebrews chapter 4. <laughs> Good lead-in, Matt. Nice. Good transition. Hebrews chapter 4. Look at verse 12 here with me. It says, For the word of God, it's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, referring to God's sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So you read it here, the word of God here, it's this living and active, it, it's this sword that, that cuts you open. The idea of it, it, it uh, it's sharpening into a sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. You read the Bible, if you really actually do, you will see how you fall short. It'll pierce you. It'll be like, have you ever like, done that before? You've read, you know, a passage or something, or you've heard a sermon maybe, and you're like, oh man, like that one hurt, like, <laughs> Have you ever had that before where you're like sitting in a sermon and you're like, wow, he was, actually, he was talking to me, that one. Like so maybe, he know, maybe he knows what's going on in my heart or something, but like that was right to me because I know that's where I'm wrong. That's what I'm not doing. I, ne- I need to do that. You had like sweaty palms when you read the Bible or something like that. Or you hear a sermon, something like that. You're nervous. You're scared. Like, you're like whoa, that was, that was wrong. Like, I, or not that was wrong. The Bible's not wrong, but I'm wrong. That's the idea of, uh, of what, what the author of Hebrews is saying here. It's, it cuts you open. It reaches the depth of your heart. It discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Sometimes you read the Bible and like you read something and you're like, wow, I didn't even know I was thinking that. I, don't even, I didn't even think my intentions were that. But I think after I read that text, I realized that, wow, I, I am really messed up. I am really sinful. You read it and then you feel conviction over it. That's the idea of reproof. It, it, Bible teaching, reproof profitable for teaching, for reproof. The next thing, if you flip, flip back over to 2 Timothy, the next thing is, is for teaching and reproof for correction. Next thing is, not only it, it reproves you, not only it shows you where you're wrong, but it also helps you correct. It gets you off the wrong path, but it now gets you on the right path. It's this positive aspect of, you know, gives you salute, offers solutions, gives you restoration. You think about the Bible, I mean, what it really offers you is you think about the gospel for a minute. That's the, the main theme of the Bible, like the gospel. Well, what's the idea of the gospel? It fixes your problem. It corrects your, your main issue with sin, the biggest issue that you have in life, where you fall short of God's perfect perfect uh, act for your life. The gospel fixes it. It fixes your ultimate problem of sin, corrects your dead state. The Bible it offers correction. It shows you not only where you went wrong, but how you can go right. I love what Psalm 119, 9 through 11. Psalm 119, 9 through 11. 
could write it down. You don't have to turn there with me. Psalm 119, 9 through 11, it says, how can a young man keep his way pure? It's a question. How can a young man keep his way pure? Well, by guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. David's here, he's, he's so passionate about God's word. He's so, he's so, he loves it so much. He says, with my whole heart, I seek you. How, how, can I, how can I do the right thing? How can I not sin? How can I avoid temptation? Well, I can do that by storing up your word in my heart. I, I can keep my way pure by guarding it according to your word. The, the Bible, it offers correction. It offers the, the fix. So one of the Bible's purposes, one of its big main, I would argue, one of its main themes and main purposes is to keep you away from sin, protect you from, from the dangers of sin. That's why you read it. You read it for teaching, for reproof, for correction. And the last one here is, is training in righteousness. So it not only fixes and corrects your sin, but it also shows you now how to live a godly life. Now it shows how, how, how you can be trained up and to, to, to live the way that God has, has called us to live. If you're at Revival this year, we, uh, or hopefully, you memorized Psalm 1. Do you guys remember that? You guys forgot about now, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Psalm 1, remember it here with me, okay? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yield fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all he does, he prospers. That's verses one through three. I'm impressed by that. That was good. I, I feel good. I feel like I can walk off and we can, uh, we can have a great Sunday now. But that's, that's all. Psalm, wh- what are we saying? We just, that, hey, thank you. So you think about Psalm one. What did he just say here? He says, He's th- this blessed man, this, this man who's, who's thriving, this godly guy. He, he doesn't delight in, 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 in living in the world, but he, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And he meditates on it day and night. And what, is he, what does it describe him as a, in verse 3? It says he's like, a, he's like a tree. What? Planted by streams of water. So he's, he's rooted here near this stream. So he's always got the nutrients to, to, bring, to bring into the tree. I guess that's what a root does, right? It brings nutrients, brings water into the tree so that the, the tree can be nourished and so that the tree can grow, bear fruit. So that's, that's the idea of, uh, of the word. It, it, it helps you grow. It helps you bear fruit. It helps you not only avoid sin and corrects you from sin, but it also helps you live a righteous life. It's a playbook for your life. If you cut, if you cut yourself off from the nutrients, you know, the tree, like how many trees like survive in the desert? Well, not many. Why? Because the desert has no water. It doesn't have the nutrients that it, it needs. If you cut yourself off from the nutrients of God's word, you, I mean, you suffer. You, like, it was like this morning. Like I, I woke up this morning. I don't know if you ever had this happen before where you like sleep on your arm wrong and it goes completely numb. Why? Because sometimes I sleep like with like my arm like over, like under my pillow like that. And so I lay my head on my arm. And so like I cut off all circulation last night. And so I woke up with one arm. And I felt this arm under my pillow. And I was like, is that Karina? And I was like, no, it's not. I was like, she doesn't have calloused hands. Like, that's my hand. And I was like, it was cold. And I was like, did I just lose my arm? And I freaked out. This was this morning. Like, like this was this morning at at 6 o'clock. When I woke up, I was like, I have one arm. Like, I freaked out. Why? Because I slept on the blood vessel wrong. My head weight was there all night long and, and it cut off all circulation. What happened? My hand like didn't die, but like it kind of died. Like it was, it was cold. It cut off all circulation. I cut off the nutrients to my arm, the circulation, the blood flow to my arm and it died, if you will. It, it withered, if you will. And, and every time you decide to not read God's word, it's like sleeping on your arm like that, cutting off the nutrients that you need. I always like to think of it as like your phone, like your phone, like Think about if your phone was plugged into the wall at all times, you would never lose charge. You would al- it would always be alive because it's always plugged into the source. If you ever cut that off, if you ever, you know, spend a couple weeks of not reading God's word, it's like you sleeping on your arm like I did last night or, or, or unplugging your phone from the wall and never plugging it back in. That's, that's the idea. You, you cut off that source and you, you die. You wither away. If you cut off the, nu- the, the, nu- the nutrients, Bible always describes itself as as food or as water. 
Maybe you've heard it. The Bible is like spiritual milk that you're supposed to long for. that helps you grow up. Well, that too. You can't go very long without food. You can, I mean, I know you can only go like three hours without food or like less, maybe one hour and you just need more food, more food, more food. Cutting yourself off from all kinds of nutrients, you, you, you put yourself in a, in a bad situation. So don't cut yourself off from the Bible. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, now for training in righteousness, for, the, for growth. Verse 17, it says, so the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. The first thing it says, you read the Bible so that you can be a man of God that's complete. The idea here is you're proficient, you're capable. You're, um, one of the lexicons I looked at said, you're being well fit for, for any function. And I love that. You're, re- you're ready, you're ready to go. It's like uh, a lot. Of, I know a lot of you guys play sports. To, to play a sport and to be good at a sport, you have to like prepare for it, right? Like there's this thing called practice. That maybe you do, maybe you don't do. Maybe you're bad because you don't practice. But but you have to practice to be good at anything. You've got a game day. Your game day's tomorrow. What do you have to do tonight? You got to drink. You know, you got to drink water. You got to drink fluid so that you're hydrated. You're ready to go. You've got energy. You got you to gotta carb up. You got to eat your pasta tonight so that you're ready to go with all the energy, all the carbs tomorrow so that you're, you're ready to get, you got to be physically prepared. You got to be mentally prepared for, for the opposition. You got a game plan for wh- what you're going to do, how you're going to, I don't know, whatever sport you play, you got you to gotta game plan for the, for the opponent. You got to be complete. And that's the, that's the word picture here is you're, Complete is you're ready to go. You're ready to, to go do some task. And the idea here is you're complete. You're ready to go out and to take on the world, if you will. You're complete. You're ready to go. You're capable. You're proficient. You're well fit for the, for the job ahead of you. That's what, that's what you want to be. That's what I want to be. We want to be ready for every good work. That's kind of the summary of the whole thing. Equipped for every good work, it says. It's a summary of all of these things for teaching, for reproof, for correction, training in righteousness, so you'd be complete. The idea is that you're equipped now for every good work. You're ready to lean on Scripture to always do the right thing. Remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan? Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. He's there being tempted by Satan. And what does he do to avoid temptation? Do you remember? Satan says, do this. And, and Jesus, what does he do? He, he quotes Scripture at, right back at him. And he says, you know, Satan tells him to, to bow down to him or to, to jump off the the cliff or whatever. And Jesus, he quotes back scripture and he says, you know what? No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this. Why? He fights it with, he fights temptation with, with the word of God. That's what, that's what we got to do. We got to be equipped for every good work. We got to be using scripture to, to fight against sin. Be ready, equipped to, to, to uh, for, uh, equipped for every good work rather. So we've come up with a system of how to help you do these two things. How, how you can read your Bible better this year, by how you can read to know God better and how you can read to grow better. So we did that by reading plan from whatever that was, July. Was it like July to, to the end of the year? We finished that. Last week I came and told you, I said, our new reading plan we're going to do is we're going to jump on with the rest of the church for every day in the Word and we're going to read at least, at least the New Testament in the Psalms and Proverbs. It's not that hard. Sometimes like today, it was like less than a chapter for the New Testament. And then Psalm is like one Psalm. And then Proverbs, you like read like three verses or something like that. It's not very hard. It's not, it's probably less reading that I required for that other, that other uh, Bible reading plan. So that's what, that's what we want to do this year. We want to jump on that. It, 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 the, the whole church, we're doing the Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs. That's what I'm going to do. That's probably what your leaders are doing. I would encourage you, if, if you're ready to take on the challenge of the Old Testament in Leviticus with, with Johnny, right? If you're ready to take on that challenge, do the Old Testament as well. But I want you to at least be doing the New Testament and the Psalms and Proverbs. I think that's the low bar. That's, it, it's not really going to get easier than that. And it really doesn't get easier than that because like, if you have a phone or a iPod or I, no one has an iPod touch anymore. Who who has an iPod? Oh, oh. Okay, well, I take that back. Boop. I take that back. All of you I I just ate my words. All of you guys with a phone or with some sort of smart phone or device or iPod touch, what you want to do is you want to get the ESV app, the English Standard Version app, and it on, on there has wow, I have some text like Trisha texted me. What's up, Trisha? <laughs> um Anyway, on here, there's all of these, there's all of these plans here on the ESV app, reading plans. 
And so we want to do every, every day in the Word here, and it has a checklist for all of the different readings that I have to do today. So it has Genesis 13 through 15, Matthew 5, 27 through 48. And all you have to do is like click on it and it takes you right there. So you could do it all right here on your phone. You don't even have to turn in your Bibles. I know it's like four different places. You just do it right here. You get it right here on the app. Every day in the Word, right there. It's a checklist for you. It's super, super easy. And so I want you to read God's Word. But if you remember last semester, I wanted you guys to post on our on our page. Well, this year, I've got a different idea for you. And I think it's going to be better. I want us to not only read God's Word, but to interact with it, to, to think about it, to meditate on it, if you will. And so what we're going to do instead of posting online is we're going to give each one of you guys a journal. So you're going to get a journal. We want you to, to journal through what you're, what you're reading. So journaling was something big for me in college. I went to college and uh, I went to college, yeah, big boy. And uh, at college, yeah, thank you. At college, I, I, started, I started journaling like every single day and it really helped me think deeper about God's word and to actually interact with it on, on, a, on a deeper level. And, and it helped me, helped me, honestly, it helped me grow in college because I was journaling. So we're gonna give every one of you guys a journal. They're not like amazingly like revolutionary, they're just a thing with some paper in it. But the idea is what we want you to do is we want you to journal through God's Word. So when you read Genesis 1, if you're going to do that, then you are actually going to talk about it. Not to someone, I mean, I guess to someone later, but like you want to talk about it right here. What are you going to do? Like I remember I went to college. I was like, what am I going to journal? What am I supposed to do? Well, I want you to do these two things. I want you to read God's word to know him and read God's word to grow. And so you want to do and talk about those, those two things when, when you're reading it. Here, I, I even brought mine. Mine's way cooler than yours. You know what? I'm pretty cool. I got, yeah, Karina's dad gave it to me for Christmas. It's, it's imported from Italy, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, I got to unwrap it like five times to open it up. But here we go. I started, I started journaling on the first, and I will read you my journal here. I'm, I'm ready. Like, to bear all. Tra- I'm a transparent man. Right here. This is, this is literally it. I, I'm not like, this is not like seminary trained, like Matt. No, no. Like, listen to this. Genesis 1, 1 through 2. This is what I wrote. God creates the whole world with mere words. He took great attention to detail and even created a system of rest for us. He gave man dominion over everything. I need to stand in awe of the creator and worship him. What is that? Like four sentences? And then I did it through Matthew. Matthew 1, one through two. This is what I said. God sent his son at the right time, at the right place, and in the right family. This miraculous account of the incarnation was just according to Old Testament prophecy and God's plan. That, like, you don't have to go to seminary to write that. Like, that's not profound. It's just what I'm reading, I'm explaining, I'm thinking about it, I'm meditating on what I just read. And then I'm just dialoguing about it. I'm talking about the incarnation. I'm thinking about who God is. What am I learning about God? God sent his son at the right place at the right time to the right family. I'm thinking about, wow, God is a God of detail. He think, he's, he's important. He's got this plan that he's going to send Jesus into the world. That, like, that's, that's it. Like, that is not really profound. Like, that, like, look at that. Like, that's not, you can't even read it, right? It's chicken scratch. But that's how I journal. I want to journal so that I can know God better, thinking about who God is, but I'm also thinking about what, what I can do to grow, how, how I can actually do something about it. Maybe, maybe that, those two ones weren't like amazingly about reading to grow, but here you go. Genesis 3 through 4. I'll read you that one too. I say, we see the serpent tempting Eve to sin. We see the powerful effect of sin the powerful effect that sin has on the world, especially in how much it affects our relationship with God. We also see how God came, or God cares about offerings, referring to Cain and Abel. I should see my sin more like God sees my sin. Like, again, not super profound, but like I'm thinking about what God just did in that, in that passage. I'm thinking about who God is, but I'm also thinking about what can I do? I, I need to see my sin like God sees my sin. I'm, I'm growing. I'm thinking about how I can progress and, and grow. And so that's why we're going to give each and every one of you a journal, and we want you to do these two things. 
to reflect on who God is, to read, to know, but also read, to grow. What can you, what can you do about it? So we're going to hand these out at the end, but that's not all. That's not all, folks. Um, what we're going to do is on, on Friday nights, you are going to bring your journal to small groups. Again, it doesn't have to be profound. You see, I went to seminary, and like that's how profound my journal is, okay? Like that's, I don't know, that's all you, that's all you get. That's the low bar. Like that's it. You just, all you have to do is to do it. I, I would say every day, but if you can do it at least five times a week, you bring it to small groups, the first five or ten minutes of each small group, what we're going to do is we're just going to open it up and be like, I don't know, hey, Matthias, what would you learn this week? Oh, well, I learned this and this and this. You read it, and you're like, great, cool. All right. What would you learn, Jacob? Cool. Great. We're talking about God's Word. We're reflecting on it. And so hopefully you guys can bring these every week to two small groups on Friday night, we could talk about what we're, what we're learning, how we're, how we're growing, how we can know God and how we can grow. And so that's, that's what I want us to do. That's the, the, the vision for, for this year is I want us to know and I want us to grow when we open up our Bibles. And if we do that, unlike the bacon, it can change your life. It can. If you really, if you really focus on those two things, think about knowing God and by growing. If you do those two things, we can see some powerful things coming out of our Bible reading. And honestly, when I journal, it just helps me understand it more too. Like I didn't even think about that, but it helps me understand what I'm reading more because I actually have to like dialogue with it again. Like you have to think about it to write anything about it. So hopefully this doesn't become tedious for you, but hopefully it, you look back and I've got, I, I, we were going through our garage this week and I had all of these journals that I had from college. Like I was doing it like every day and had these big fat journals of just everything I was writing and thinking about. That's cool. Like to look back on that, like I've journaled through the whole Bible, I think like twice now or something like that. I'm not doing that to like brag to you, but I'm doing that just because I just started doing it in college and I, yeah, I wrote some things down and guess what? Now I have it forever and I can, I can look back at what I read. It's hard to do that with the posting situation, but with a journal, it's not hard to do that. So how does that sound? Good? Do you do it? Again, it's not hard. It's really not much more than I told you to do last semester. But it's just helpful to have something to write down. Like just get your thoughts on paper and then be able to keep that and be able to thumb through it later. So hopefully you can do that this year. We want to read to know. We want to read to grow. I know you like that. That's why I did it. Know and grow. That's what we want to do when we read our Bibles. Sound good? Got it? It is majestic. I know it is. So let's, uh, let's, go, let's go pray right now. Let's pray. And uh, let's, uh, let's get serious about our Bible reading this, this year. So let's, let's bow our heads right now. God, we are so thankful for your word, God, that it is from you, that it's God-breathed, that it is your very words through the, 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 the context of these authors and through their, their styles and, and just different ways of communicating things. God, we're so thankful that you've inspired every single word, that our Bibles are inerrant, meaning that they have no error. Everything that we read in here is true, God. We are, we are so thankful that we can, in this world of turmoil, we can read something that we can be 100% certain is, is true. God, we're so thankful for that. And I, I thank you that it's not just God-breathed, but it's also profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that we can be equipped, so that we can be complete, equipped for every, every good work. God, we're so thankful that you have not left us alone, but you've given us a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. God, I pray that we would use it better this year. We would use these uh, Bible reading plans and these, these journals as a means of knowing you and as a means of growing more in your likeness, God. So we're so, so thankful for your word as we reflect on it this morning. God, I pray that you would help us keep these resolutions when February rolls around, when July rolls around, even when December rolls around. God, I pray that we could do this all the way till the end of the year. God, please help us do that. It's hard. I know that some days it's monotonous and it's boring and, and it, it just, it, it's hard for us to do it and wake up early. God, but I pray you would help it come alive to us. You'd help us get excited about it. Like the like the man in Psalm 1, that we would, that our delight would be in the law of the Lord. And on your law, we would meditate day and night because we love it so much, because we crave it so much. God, please get us to that place. We love you, God. We're so thankful for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.